Welcome back, everybody. This is Eric here with Iraq Veteran 8888. All right, today we got some more 2A news. This isn't necessarily news. It's really more of an op-ed from Dean Weingarten over on MLM. However, I think it does provide some really interesting context. I know a lot of people are always asking, like, hey, you know, when are we going to repeal the NFA? When are we going to, you know, scale back on some of these long-standing gun regulations that have been crammed down our throats for years, these long-standing infringements, right? You know, what can we do? What is the incrementalism that's going to occur that's going to make all this go away? Uh, well, he put together a, a great article that goes into some great detail and a lot of things that I want to discuss. And uh, we do see that, you know, these things do work, right? Look at Canada's long-standing, uh, you know, long gun registry they were going to try to do, right? And they wound up throwing it out because it wound up being prohibitively expensive and requiring a ton of manpower. And they wound up doing away with their long gun registry up in Canada. So we see that, you know, if we can make something really uh, burdensome and expensive uh, for them to, you know, undertake and, and keep up with, then eventually the tides do turn. So we're going to get into this. Before we get started, I would like to thank our friends at CMMG for supporting our videos. If you're looking for anything in the AR category, they are the king of weird. They got some awesome stuff going on. I know you're familiar with the Mark 47. They're mutant. Uh, also known as the Mutant, uh, the 762 by 39 hybrid, uh, which is really cool. They've also got their bufferless descent line, which is awesome with your folding stocks and whatnot. Really cool stuff. They've also got their uh, 22 conversion kits that work amazing. We've done videos on all this stuff. Check them out, CMMG, and tell them we sent you. Big thanks to them for supporting our channel. All right, we're going to get into this one, boys and girls. And Dean always puts together some great articles, and this is sort of a continuation of an older article that he put out, uh, but let's get into it. Incremental strategy to reform and repeal the National Firearms Act. <laughs> well then, okay. Previously, this correspondent wrote an essay on incrementalism versus all or nothing, and it was well received. Ronald T. Gunner, Mr. Weingarten, I take my hat off to you. This article is the best thing I've ever read in modern memory. Now tell me, how do we get incremental movement on repealing the NFA? And for all you naysayers, sit down, shut up, or help us get it done. Incremental movement is happening to dismantle the National Firearms Act bit by bit. The ultimate goal is repeal. Here is how it is being done and what needs to be done in the future. Educate gun culture and the general public. The first step is well underway. It is to educate the gun culture and the general public about the history and failure of the National Firearms Act. When people learn the history and effects of the act, support for it evaporates. When people understand the NFA is a result of a political compromise that did nothing to stop crime, but results in thousands of Americans being punished for peaceful acts, support for the NFA drops to politically irrelevant numbers. Support for the NFA is fairly wide, but very shallow propped up by the dominant media and their creation and pro proliferation of false narratives. Overwhelm the NFA system with compliance. Hmm. The second step, again, well underway, is to overwhelm the system with compliance. This sounds counterintuitive, but it has a, long, uh, a strong and corrosive effect on the NFA. One of the insidious components of the NFA was to create extreme prohibitive taxes to make the NFA an effective ban instead of regulation. When the act was passed, the $200 tax was equivalent to $3,700 today. It was 40 times the cost of a maximum silencer. In 1938, the first federal minimum wage was set at 25 cents an hour. In 1938, it would take 800 hours of minimum wage labor to pay the insane $200 tax. Today, the federal minimum wage is $7.25, with 30 states having significantly higher minimums. With the growth of the federal government and the uh, debasement of the U.S. dollar over 80 years, the tax has been reduced from 800 hours of minimum wage labor to less than 28 hours of minimum wage labor. In 1934, the tax took almost two months to pay for the average income. Today, the tax is about one day's pay for the average income. For decades, there were very few people who could afford legal NFA items. Today, the vast majority of Americans can afford the $200 tax. This has led to enormous increases in the number of people who have legal NFA firearms. Virtually everyone has to go through the insane loops required to obtain an NFA item. It's disguised with the sheer idiocy of the law. With knowledge comes support for repeal of the NFA, in part or in all. 
1990, there were 399 Form 1s and 7,024 Form 4s uh, processed. In 2020, there were 40,790 Form 1s and 20, uh, 246,600 Form 4s processed, an increase of 100 times for Form 1s and 35 times for Form 3s. Every person who makes a legal silencer to the or takes a le legal silencer at the gun club contributes to the demise of the NFA. Every hobbyist who makes a short barrel rifle legally contributes to the demise of the NFA. There are now over 2.6 million legal silencers in the United States. In 1990, there were about 30,000 estimated. Overwhelming compliance leads to normalization and acceptance by the gun culture and eventually the general public. Acceptance. Uh, leads to the dismantling of the National Firearms Act. All right, we've got a, a cool picture here of a Mauser broom handle. Uh, we have an integral suppressed Ruger Mark I. So an interesting note on the Mauser broom handle, and what, what I think is odd, the reason they chose to um, you know, show the Mauser broom handle is it's actually not a short barrel rifle. Uh, the Mauser broom handle falls under the exemption OK, uh, because of its historical status, uh, guns like the English slotted Browning high power with the shoulder stock, certain 1911s with shoulder stocks, certain uh, Mauser broom handles, of course, and many of the Astras with shoulder stocks are all exempt from the NFA because of their historical significance and relevance. Uh, so I think it's interesting that the reason that he's, he's showing that is because that's part of that overall acceptance, the idea that. This gun is not anything, you know, crazy. It's just, it's historically relevant and important. Take the NFA apart piece by piece. The third incremental step is to attack the NFA part by part. The weakest link in the NFA is the tax and regulation of silencers. Silencers registered with the NFA have gone from relatively rare in 1968, probably on the order of a couple of thousand, records are difficult to find, to over 2.6 million as of May of 2021. There are strong movements to remove silencers slash suppressors from the NFA. There is significant evidence many inside the ATF want silencers removed from the NFA. The next weakest link is short barrel rifles and shotguns, also known as SBRs and SBSs. There is no logical reason to restrict these firearms more than handguns. Short barrel rifles and shotguns are generally harder to conceal than handguns, but handguns enjoy constitutional protections affirmed by the Heller and McDonald decisions. Remover, removal of short barrel rifles and shotguns to the same regulation as pistols is easily understood. Automatic firearms will be the most difficult to remove from the NFA. A strong case exists to remove that 1986 ban on further manufacture for sale to non-government entities and to reinterpret the law to mean sale to non-government entities only required governmental the permission instead of a ban. The current wording of the law is ambiguous enough for this interpretation. Keeping the excise tax at $200 or, or alternatively reducing or eliminating the tax is key to reforming the NFA. With reform or reinterpretation of the 1986 freeze on sales of automatic firearms, the number will increase. Normalization will occur, and processing for acquiring automatic firearms will become much easier, as has happened with silencers. Legal owners of NFA items have shown themselves to be exemplary uh, models of law-abiding citizens. Uh, experience will show legal ownership to be a non-problem in the long term. Reform of the NFA will be accelerated with action in the states. The irrationality of the NFA is so conspicuous. State reforms for sil silencer law and SBR, SBS law are obvious incremental goals. The general pattern is this. Removal, uh, remove the state bans on position, uh, possession of NFA items. Remove the state bans on hunting with NFA items. Remove state bans on the NFA item altogether. And then ban state resources from enforcing federal law restricting the NFA item. Uh, I know some of you have heard of the NFA sanctuary states and things like that. These actions increase the use and normalization of silencers, short-barreled rifles, and short-barreled shotguns. Each part can be accomplished as an incremental act while maintaining the express goal of removing these irrational restrictions altogether. As more and more states remove restrictions, the statistics will show how irrational the law uh, are. And a good example is marijuana legalization, where you see in many states where they've, um, you know, 
legalized marijuana for you know personal use or even for non medicinal use. Um, it hasn't led to any type of a of an increase in any sort of crime or anything. In fact, I would say the opposite's actually true. You know, uh, would you rather someone be out uh, driving drunk on the streets and acting like a belligerent dickhead? Or would you rather them, you know, just have a little pot on their porch and not really, you know, just want to sit around and murder a bag of chips and not bother anybody? I, I would say, arguably, uh, people are much more belligerent on alcohol than they are on marijuana. I'm not a user of marijuana. However, I don't think it should be illegal federally. I think that we should totally remove uh, marijuana and psilocybin from Schedule 1 completely. Uh, that's another topic, though. This is precisely what happened in Texas, where local officials are now banned from enforcing federal laws on silencers, and there is no local restrictions on silencer possession or use. Texas already has the highest number of legal silencers of any state in the nation, with over a half a million. Florida is next, with 175,000, and then Georgia, with 130,000. That's what I'm talking about, Georgia. Good job. The final step should be the refe repeal of the NFA as anti-ethical to the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court is a follower, not a leader, in protecting the Bill of Rights. When activists and states make enough progress showing the insanity of the NFA, the courts will eventually follow. Unfortunately, this is uh, reality as this correspondent sees it. The actions are not necessarily sequential. Many can and should overlap and proceed concurrently. The Program for Incremental Reform slash Repeal. Education. Massive compliance, state action on suppressors, SBRs, SBSs, NFA sanctuary states, removal of suppressors, silencers from the NFA, removal of SBRs and SBSs from the NFA, repeal and reinterpretation of the 1986 ban on the production of automatic firearms for legal ownership. Last but not least, repeal the NFA or finding the NFA is unconstitutional under an invigorated Second Amendment with an originalist and textual, uh, textualist Supreme Court. And again, what, what we're really referring to there, when, when he says that, when Mr. Weingarten says that, he's referring to the Bruin standard. Now, that really does change things quite a bit moving forward. I mean, there, that does provide a very difficult precedence that the government has to overcome to justify uh, the reasoning behind the existing gun laws and any further regulations that might uh, you know, come about, right? So like if a bill gets sent to a committee and they're going to go and, you know, kind of look at this bill in committee and decide if it's something that has some constitutional muster or that it, you know, is something they think they have the votes to even push forward. Right. Like in that committee, they should be going, look, you know, let's let's already let's look at this under the Bruin smell test. Does this new gun law, does it check these boxes? And if the answer is no, well, then it should pretty much just be dead on the floor before it even even makes it even to a vote. It shouldn't even make it out of committee in that particular case. But we see that with a politically driven uh, you know, let's just say, I mean, obviously every politician is politically driven. I mean, whether they're left or right, Republican, Democrat, that maybe that's not a good way to say politically driven. But when they're using, you know, their political office for extremely specific motivated tasks that are motivated to a very specific political undertaking, and in this case, you know, restricting or completely removing uh legal ownership of firearms for civilians and doing that in any way they possibly can, even if it means passing dirty laws, knowing that in the long term, you know, these things are going to get thrown at the wall like spaghetti, right? And one or two of those pieces of spaghetti is going to stick. And the ones that stick, they view as a victory because they knew that the whole pot of spaghetti getting thrown at the wall was unlawful and unconstitutional to begin with. So we see that that's how a lot of gun laws are getting passed, right? Um, especially at the federal level, when we look at the, the federal side of things, right? You know, they know dang well that what they're proposing is unconstitutional and that eventually, you know, especially in, in, a, in a reasonable Supreme Court like we have now, these things are going to get shot down in time. And they know that, but they're willing to waste taxpayer dollars knowing dang well that they have unlimited funds to fight this. And you got people like Michael Cargill who are, you know, fighting in the trenches right now to fight the bump stock case, right? Bump stock ban that Donald Trump signed. Donald Trump signed an executive order to ban bump stocks, and that created a domino effect that made all these other things occur, right? The frame and receiver rule that we're, we're currently looking at right now. Um, the, the, the brace situation, right? The potential bans on ammo and, and, and all of these sorts of just crazy regulatory burdens uh, that these people are swiping a pin and expecting the ATF and other alphabet agencies to just walk line and step and enforce 
uh, without any sort of, <laughs> you know, wherewithal as to whether or not it's constitutional, whether or not it's right or anything. They're just getting their marching orders from some politically driven overlord that's placed in there in a politically driven and politically placed position in those organizations to carry out the will and edicts of uh, a certain political fashion. And, and that tends to be almost like in a KGB sort of way, right? The KGB was the same way. They would go around and round people up. They'd say, show me the man, I'll show you the crime. That's what's occurring right now in America. You know, we're a nation of laws. We're a nation of checks and balances. We are a nation where, you know, we have a very specific way of passing laws and making things become law and then enforcing those laws and having equal protection under the law. We're not supposed to have a two-tier justice system. We're not supposed to have a, a situation where, you know, one person gets political favoritism or special treatment or their crimes get ignored or something like that. And we're seeing that rampantly happening in our society. Like when that pendulum swings from other, one direction to the other, right, left or right, no matter which direction, it's always going to incrementally work its way down and cut a little deeper. And the people that are the victims are the people, the people that those you know particular wills and edicts of these terrible politicians are subject to, right? These people are subject to this stuff. And all the while, you've got the alphabet agencies and law enforcement agencies who just want to keep their jobs and their pensions. They're fighting tooth and nail to try to just, you know, have some sense of normalcy in their everyday life. And all they see is every four to eight years, the pendulum swings in a different direction and their marching orders change. But the, the boot still has to march, right? There still has to be a boot that smashes on someone's neck. And that's the issue. Until we correct that paradigm in our society, we're not going to fix these types of issues. Now, now, this article was great, and I wanted to try to provide some insight for, you know, when people ask me this question all the time, hey, how in the world can we repeal the NFA? How is this ever going to happen? You know, that's what people always say. Well, if you've done right to organizations, GOA, NRA, FPC, Second Amendment Foundation, you know, uh, Nagger, any of you guys, right, whoever y'all might be, well, why haven't you repealed the NFA? Why, why, why have we had such a difficult time doing it? Well, because just like pro-gun legislation is extremely, or anti-gun legislation is extremely difficult to get through at a federal level, imagine pro-gun legislation. There is even less of an appetite to pass pro-gun legislation on the federal side than there is especially something that's going to repeal a long-standing law that's been there forever. Yeah, forget that. Both Democrats and Republicans are not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole because they don't view the gun issue as being quite important enough for them to really expend the political capital and the potential for pissing off their constituents whether they're pro-gun or not pro-gun, I think that their view of it is more that even if someone is pro-gun in their constituents, they probably assume that more of their constituents are anti-gun rather than pro-gun. And a lot of that comes down to the political narratives that are that are just parroted by the media, right? The mainstream media tries to make it out like a majority of Americans don't, they want stronger gun laws or, or they think the gun laws we have are not strict enough or they don't think that people should own suppressors or machine guns or modern rifles or even guns at all for that matter. But the truth is, is that the tide is changing. Like the, the attitude is changing when it comes to firearms ownership in this country. And there's a wide variety of different people from many different backgrounds, different faiths, different religions, different races, different ethnic backgrounds. I mean, you name it, no matter what type of random def, uh, detractor you want to try to point at someone and say, oh, well, what about the trans community, the gay community, the straight community, the Christian community, the Jew community, the Muslim community? What about the black community, the white community, the Asian community, the Hispanic community, Latina, whatever, like draw whatever line in the sand you want. More and more people from many different backgrounds and walks of life, rich and poor, fat and ugly, strong and weak, like you name it, whatever detractor you want to come up with, many, many people absolutely cherish and love the Second Amendment. And I think that as things are turning with the culture, so does the laws. And that is what this particular article is meant to to really drive home. Uh, so great reporting there, Dean. Uh, that, that's a great talking point to help me kind of drive a discussion. I appreciate that data. And uh, look, it's all going to be okay, guys. We have to keep our eyes on the prize. Bruin does provide a very difficult landscape for these people to, to trudge through, okay? They know dang well that all of these long-standing infringements are on, uh, on, on thin ice, okay? We have to be patient. We have to fight them with, with, with the law books, okay? Right now, that, that's what's seeming to work. You know, like the, 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 the circuit courts are handing down some doozies, right? The Supreme Court has shown a very, very good renewed interest in, in hearing more to a related cases. So let's let them have their moment. Let's let them have that. And let's see how this all shakes down. And I think that we're going to see 
you know, in our lifetime, the NFA will be repealed in its entirety, right? Remember common use, okay? There's been a lot of common use uh, arguments that have been made, and I, I think it's safe to say that in Georgia alone, 130,000 suppressors, come on, that's common use. That's just for one state. We're talking millions of suppressors that are in circulation now at, at, a, at a national level. And how many of those suppressors are using any sort of a crime on a regular basis? Come on, okay? I think it's clear to say that the tides have turned. It's clear to say that a wide subset of Americans from many different walks of life embrace the Second Amendment and love guns. I see it every day in the people I run into and I talk to. So trust me, the culture's changing. As such, will the gun laws as well. So thank you all very much. Many more videos on the way. We'll see you soon. <laughs>